Hi, and welcome to another episode of Delaware County Political News, Meet the Expert. I am your host, Larry DeMarco, and today we are here with Professor John McLaren, Chair of the History Department at Millersville University and author of Ruling Suburbia, the most prominent book of Delaware County politics. Professor, thank you for being a guest on Delaware County Political News. Thanks for having me. From what township are you in Delaware County? I'm from the borough of Sharon Hill. I was born and raised there. I went to school there, went to Holy Spirit, grade school. Uh, then two years at St. Joe's Prep and graduated two years at Monsignor Bonner, graduated from Bonner in 1967. Also a uh, St. Joe's Prep uh, attendee myself. Oh, really? Yeah. Didn't know that. I knew you went I to... Uh... Well, I didn't like it. No? Okay. All my friends were Bonner. <laughs> oh, sure. No, I understand that. Sure. Uh, so what inspired you to write a book about Delaware County politics? Well, number one, my father and a couple of his friends got involved in democratic politics in Sharon Hill in the 1950s. They spent about three years, uh, were singularly unsuccessful. My dad came within 100 votes of winning a seat on the school board, but they just ran into this, this incredibly powerful machine. Uh, and it, at the time, in Eastern Delaware County, there were a lot of people in Sharon Hill and the other towns up and down the pike that, who worked at the the, either the Atlantic or the Gulf refineries in South Philadelphia. My dad worked at the Atlantic refinery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And a couple, a couple of his supervisors were Delaware County residents, Glen Olden or wherever, and they were mildly active in politics. They were all Republicans, and my father was and his friends were making trouble for them. And his political activities resulted in him losing his job. Now, when you say making trouble, you mean requiring them to have a competitive race. Not only that, they also brought suit against one of them. I forget the details of the lawsuit, but there was some kind of, some kind of funny business that went on with one of the elections, and they had proof, uh, and they were going to take them to court. He lost his job, and at that point, with maybe in 1960, already six or seven kids in the family and he couldn't afford it. Uh, my mother was terribly upset. So he withdrew completely from it. While he had been in, involved in it, we, the, the kids he had us running around delivering you know, handouts to people's houses for a couple of years, we did that every Saturday, particularly as election time came around. But then it was kind of forgotten until years later, 1993, uh, I was in graduate school at Delaware. I started college rather late. I didn't start college until I was 38 years old. Um, and the McClure Mansion, as it was called, was, had just been sold. And there was a little, brief little article on the sale of the house in the Delaware County Daily Times. My dad sent me the, the news clipping with a little note saying, this would make an interesting paper for one of your classes. So I thought, okay, I'm familiar with it. It's local. It should be easy to research. Um, and I wrote a paper, 25, 30 pages, I forget. I got a decent grade on the paper. I talked to the professor about developing this into a dissertation because, you know, every doctoral student's looking for a topic for a dissertation because you're supposed to write about something new. And he said, no, that'll never work. Uh, you'll never get enough information for a dissertation because political machines don't leave paper trails typically. <laughs> you know, they're uh, at least the ones he was familiar with. But I didn't listen to him. Um, and, you know, with the memories of my father and the fact that it would be, it might be a long slog, but at least I wouldn't have to travel. I mean, I had, I had fellow students who were traveling overseas researching dissertations. Wow. So I spent the next year and a half, uh, a lot of that time at the Delaware County Historical Society, just going through day after day after day of the Chester Times and whatever other newspapers they had. I went through uh, collections of documents at places. I was up in Harvard. I was down to the University of Maryland. I was at the uh, uh, 
Hagley Museum, which had a ton on, on Pew and the Pew family, Sun Oil Company. Um, I was all over the place. And, and it, it took me about the better part of two years to put all this information together. The writing went fairly quickly. I was able to write the dissertation in about six months. Um, and one of my concerns, of course, was I needed to make sure I could document everything I said because if I, I knew the people in Delaware County, and actually my father was more concerned than I was, my father asked to make sure that anything, anybody you talk to, that you were John Morrison McLarnon the third, because he still lived in Delaware County, he was afraid of whatever they might, might do to him. Uh, I got a post office box, I got a separate phone number, just so people didn't start harassing me. But it was a, uh, two and a half year project, something like that. And uh, the dissertation wound up having something like 2,100 footnotes. As I say, I wanted to document it fully. But I think I pretty much got the story. Um, and it was acceptable to my professors when I graduated. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> what was the, the theme? What was your thesis? I just, you know, I, I, when I started out, I just wanted to write a biography, a biography of McClure, a biography of the machine that he created. So who was John McClure? And take us back to the history or the beginning of the GOP machine in Delaware County. Well, I'll go back to his father. His father's name was William McClure, Billy McClure he was known as. Uh, Billy was the son of a guy who had, had emigrated here from Ireland. Um, he grew up Actually, he grew up in the outskirts of Chester, but he moved into the city of Chester. I don't remember what his education was. He wasn't college educated, but he had some education. And he opened a, a liquor store, a wholesale and retail liquor store, Third and Curlin in Chester. Um, he made the acquaintance and he made a, struck up a friendship with a guy named Thomas Clayton who was a renegade Republican and was running against the Republican establishment in Delaware County. Now, understand from the Civil War on, Democrats aren't getting elected to anything in Delaware County. And when are we talking about, give us a time Now frame. we're talking about uh, 1875 or thereabouts. Okay, so the long, last quarter of the 19th century. Long time ago. Oh yeah. Uh, Judge Clayton or Thomas Clayton uh, challenged the Republican establishment that was elected to the to the bench and at that time there was just one judge in Delaware County he did it with the the support of Billy McClure and other bar a distillery whatever you went and you got a license the license were awarded by the judge at liquor court who in this case you know was what Clayton or whoever Clayton got elected with the support of McClure and his fellow bar owners and distillers and whatnot and all of a sudden the number of liquor licenses just multiplied like crazy to the upset of some in the county but others were quite happy with it. Um, McClure continued his relationship with Clayton and by in, within 10-15 years McClure had become the most prominent of this group of l liquor dealers who generated remarkable electoral support for Thomas Clayton. And, in, and as a result, you know, if you were associated with McClure and his cronies, your chances of getting a liquor license in January were much better. Whereas if you were against McClure, uh, your chances were less so. Not that McClure was very careful. He never eliminated anybody completely. He never shut anybody out, but he made sure that he was in control. Uh, by 1900, Clayton died around 1900, but by that time, Billy McClure had control of Chester and its surrounding uh, town boroughs and whatnot. Um, and he was considered one of the most powerful politicos in the county. Now, the county in 1900 is Chester, at Stone and those towns, and then there's just a bunch of scattered little hamlets here and there. It certainly is not the county we know today. It's it, the, the bulk of the population was in the, the, the immediate Chester and the immediate Chester area. And as I said, these little 
outlay, outlying hamlets. Upper Darby, for example, was tiny in 1900. But nonetheless, McClure's star was on the rise. Uh, he, in 1906 or so, he decided that he was going to move out of the city of Chester proper and build a house out on Providence Road, which at that time was part of North Chester. I don't think it was incorporated as part of the city yet. There were three little boroughs that now make up the city of Chester. Is this Nether Providence now? Uh, no, now it's Chester. It was still Chester. It's, now it's Chester. Okay. And he built this house at 20th and Providence. It's still standing today. Um, and he, he moved in there. Unfortunately, he didn't have long to enjoy it. He died within a year and a half or so of the house being built. When he died, the big question was, well, what's going to happen to this machine that he runs? Because he was, he, he was the same as any of the big time city political bosses, you know, with the coal in the wintertime and the turkeys at Thanksgiving and, and all these other, and apparently quite a nice guy, a very personable man. Um, but there was a lot of confusion and a lot of questions about who was going to take over. Nobody knew that he had already made these arrangements for his, his successor, and he had his son John, who was in his second or third year of Swarthmore College at the time, he had called John down to his deathbed and told him, you're taking over. This is your operation when I die. Uh, John had grown up listening to the stories about politics and listening to people discussing strategy around the kitchen table. Uh, he, Billy had a, a, a brother named David who was somewhat politically active, but pretty clever guy. And David's job was to kind of shepherd John along until he really got his feet on the ground as a political boss. And John McClure took over in 1907. And he, with some stumbling along the way, and more than one bitter fight, electoral fight, uh, managed to stay in control, and actually one conviction and one not quite conviction, uh, but managed to stay in control till his death in 1965. And by the time he died in 1965, he had absolute, complete control over this county. In chapter six of your book, mm. you really pinpointed how he did it and the structure of the machine. Talk about that. He created this thing called the Delaware County uh, Re Republican Board of Supervisors, uh, commonly known as the War Board, although he hated that name. And he told more than one reporter, don't use that name, you know, because he did occasionally give interviews. They were short interviews, but he gave interviews. And it was a very odd setup. There was the, the number of these supervisors would vary from 11 or 12 to as many as 14. They represented specific parts of the county, although what parts of the county they represented would vary with time. So this wasn't necessarily by township and borough? No, no. no. There were some exceptions to it. I pretty much think Upper Darby was always represented by one person on the machine, but it might be Upper Darby and East Lansdowne, okay. or not East Lansdowne. It, they, it was flexible. It Understood. was elastic. Mm -hmm. um, McClure made his choices known. Now, the, technically, the supervisor from a certain area was chosen by the Republican organization in that area. You know, they would, they would hold an election, they would pick somebody. But John McClure always made his choices where he, who he wanted from that area known to the people in that area ahead of time. And if they didn't choose the person he wanted, then they would lose all the patronage jobs that people in that area held. So it looked like it was kind of local control at the township level or the borough level or whatever, but it was really John McClure calling the shots. He did the same thing with policy and, and slating people for election. He knew who he had wanted to run for whatever office, but on paper, or as far as the public was concerned, the Board of Supervisors, the War Board, would get together and slate the candidates. And this appearance, this appearance of some type of democracy, this illusion, oh, yeah. was important to him, wasn't it? Absolutely. And it was important to the people in the county. 
they, the, there was an illusion of democracy, there was an illusion of, of local control, which meant that they, seen, they thought they had control over their own destiny. He liked to use Philadelphia as his, you know, well, we don't want to be controlled by Philadelphia, this big ominous entity, you know, to the north. Of corruption, too. Oh, yeah. The contrast, hey, we don't want to be like them yeah. because of we're fleeing that bad place. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, there was no, there was no democracy. There was no control. On occasion, very rarely, but on occasions, in 1963, for instance, for some reason, McClure was not in the best of health. Uh, he had been in and out of the hospital, and a couple members of the war board decided that it was time for him to go, and they rebelled. Uh, McClure recuperated to the point where he could resume his daily activities, and he started just firing people wholesale that held patronage jobs from the areas of those people that were rebelling. Uh, finally, the governor had to step in and stop it. I mean, it, it was bloody. Uh, Larry Williams was one of the rebels. He was ran Springfield, and he was a congressman at the time. Um, Sam Dickey ran Upper Darby, and he was another one of the rebels. The third one was Bill Milliken from Sharon Hill, who was a congressman. No, we, he either was or had been congressman. Um, Milliken never recovered. He, McClure allowed the other two to continue, but uh, they kind of got back in line. You know, um, he could be, when he wanted to, be very, just act with brutal efficiency, but he didn't show it often. He, he, he didn't have to. Now these committee people, and members of the war board, they did have some specific responsibilities. Discuss the control and responsibilities that he did allow these people to have. Well, their number one responsibility was get out the vote. When all else fails, you know, elections were the single most important thing. Um, they organized the, the, the uh, campaigns in their own areas, and they actually competed against each other uh, for the highest percentage of, of the vote they could get out in their area. And McClure would adjust patronage, the awarding of patronage jobs and the number of jobs each person had to dispense to his particular area with the approval of McClure, because McClure approved every single patronage appointment. But nonetheless, their, their performance on the job, so to speak, dictated how much of the patronage pie you know, they got when the whole thing was divided up. So they had other responsibilities. You know, they met every month, and, and if they were uh, longtime uh, party members and longtime members of McClure's kind of inner circle, they would be invited to, to uh, join his hunt club down in just east of Washington. He had this very strange hunt club. The, the building's still standing. I've been down there. Uh, and he would, they would get out a couple times a year and they have horseshoe tournaments and they go hunting sorrel rail birds. I have no idea what those little birds look like. But McClure had equally strict rules about how things were to be conducted down there. And if you were invited, you went. You didn't, you didn't say, well, sorry, I got a wedding to go to that weekend. You went. But nonetheless, they would go down there and they would socialize there. It was, it's a very Spartan, it is to this day. They had no electricity down there. They lit, everything was lit by carbide, which I had to talk to a friend of mine in the sciences to find out what carbide was. Um, Professor, you talked about these patronage jobs. Yeah. How would someone get a job in the courthouse? Just file an application, submit it to the courthouse and get it based upon merit? No, there's no merit involved. <laughs> what? You mean well, it doesn't go to the best candidate? Explain that, please, Professor. Merit, if, if by merit you mean your loyalty to the machine, your willingness to get out night after night in the months leading up to, a, to an election and knock on doors and deliver literature and maybe work the polls, if that's merit, yes. What? But you mean it's not by resume? Booz Allen and the, the big time um, accounting firm are, was more than an accounting for. They did an audit of the courthouse in in this early 60s, during the time of this rebellion, um, and they found 
mechanics who couldn't fix cars, they found clerk typists who couldn't take shorthand, couldn't type. They found all kinds of people holding jobs at the courthouse for which they were, they were singularly unqualified. But what they were qualified to do was be part of the army of electoral workers that made sure that the machine stayed in power. So, no, there was no merit. Somebody, there were a couple times, I can think of maybe two times, three times, perhaps there's more, where there were people, uh, truly, really well-qualified people. Jim Gorby, the mayor of Chester in the 60s, was one. Um, Bill Kraft was another. Uh, former district, Eastern District uh, judge, you know, federal judge. But in both cases, they represented a little bit of a threat to McClure. They were people who possibly could have developed their own power bases independent of McClure. So what McClure did with the two of them was kind of send them into benign banishment by putting them on the federal bench or they would send them, I, I remember not too many years ago now, this is after McClure's gone, um, the mayor of Chester, I think it was, I read in the paper where all of a sudden he had been appointed to some kind of job in Harrisburg. And when something like that happens, I wonder, you know, this is a guy they don't want around anymore. Yeah, let's discuss that. What type of candidate was McClure attracted by? And the GOP generally? A candidate who would follow orders, a candidate who appealed to the public because he, it, it was important for him to, to maintain these illusions and people aren't going to vote for somebody that they flat out don't like. Uh, but a candidate who's perhaps not the smartest person in the world, not as my brother would say a rocket surgeon, uh, but more than anything else, somebody who can kind of understand whatever issues they're dealing with, but more than that, can sit down and be given his marching orders and be expected to follow those orders. There's a, there was a guy named Bob Watkins who was from Concordville or uh, somewhere out in the western part of the county, and he wasn't terribly bright, um, but he wound up in Congress because he would follow orders. I mean, McClure... Um, had a succession of people that he chose to run for the seventh congressional district and none of them were really towering intellects. Bill Milliken was another one. Larry Williams was pretty smart but uh, most of them were kind of second-rate people that you didn't have to worry too much about them and McClure knew that he could send them off to Washington uh, they wouldn't cause any problem down there but they weren't they weren't savvy enough to ever present a threat to him in the county. And McClure never cared. One of the secrets to his success is, after his conviction for bootlegging, um, he never cared what went on beyond the county. He really didn't care about patronage jobs in Harrisburg or in Washington, D.C. If they came along, if there was a Republican governor, a Republican president, and there was whatever jobs might be offered to people in the county, they were great. But it was the jobs in the county. It was the elected jobs and the appointed jobs in the county. That was his bread and butter. Now why? What benefit did he get from having so many income earners within that courthouse? You know, it, I claim, and I, and I teach this to my kids, that the, the two legs upon which any really good machine are standing are patronage and macing. And one is just the other side of the coin sure. from the other. What is macing? Tell us about that. Macing, please. you won't find it in the dictionary uh, under this, but uh, and I, I, the way I define it to my students is it's requiring voluntary contributions to the party, right. <laughs> essentially. Sure. Because in Pennsylvania, it's illegal to require somebody to contribute to the party as, as a, 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 condition of employment. a condition of employment. So there is no required, but you can, and McClure did, require voluntary contributions. And it was very clearly laid out exactly how much you were required to voluntarily contribute based on what your salary was. And if you refused, well, that, did your job continue? Uh, your job did not continue. But try as I might, I could never find anybody who lost their job because they didn't contribute. 
the threat of losing their job. And it's kind of over time, this mythology that built up that people lost their jobs that didn't contribute was so powerful that nobody dared. Nobody dared not contribute. And there was a guy, it was various guys, but there was always somebody in the courthouse and, and every payday. He'd be there collecting the money. People would make their, you know, their contributions. And this went right, right up to uh, judges. Now, a judge in Pennsylvania is supposed to be, up, I guess anywhere, it's supposed to be apolitical. You know, once you go on the bench, you're not political anymore. But it, the, it was understood that in order to be slated on the Republican ticket for the bench, and being slated on the Republican ticket was tantamount to election, uh, you had to pay 10% of 10 year, 1% of 10 years salary. So that's quite a chunk of money. Sure. And if you didn't, you didn't get the nomination. Whether that's the case today, I don't know. But that, in McClure's time, that was. And, and that gave him, it's, it's a curious thing because what it meant was it gave him access to a huge amount of money that was actually taxpayers' money because it was the salaries of public employees to fund his election campaign. Say that again. What is the Republican Party's money based upon? Tax money. It's public employees. From this thing called? This thing called macing. Okay. McClure is not the only one that did it, but he perfected the system. And there were times, I can think of at least two times, where the Chester Times, the forerunner, or what is now the Delaware County Daily Times, for some reason got mad at McClure. And they actually published the macing rates. What each person, based on their uh, their job, their job rating was supposed to pay. You found this in your research? Oh yeah, it was, it was published in the paper. In fact, there was, there was at one time um, the State Crime Commission, this was around 1960 or so, uh, decided they were going to investigate because everybody knew what was going on. It was an open secret in the county. The Crime Commission was going to come in and seize the records of the Republican Party to investigate these charges of macing. And right before they were scheduled to come in, Steve McEwen, who retired as a you know, Superior. Commonwealth sure. Superior, okay. Yeah. Um, One or the other. <laughs> Steve McEwen hired uh, an attorney from, from Philadelphia, he was a senior assistant district attorney from Philadelphia, and I, I can't remember his name. He was very prominent. Sprague? Yeah, Richard Sprague. He appointed him as a special prosecutor to investigate these nefarious charges of macing. And this is when Steve McEwen was DA, you said? Yes. And Sprague came in and took all the records, took all the records and put them under lock and key, would not allow the Crime Commission access to them and kept them, kept them for over two years until the whole thing with the state kind of calmed down and, and petered out. And it turned out, I think one person, some, some one person was, was convicted on some kind of minor charge. But yeah, it, it was, as I say, common knowledge. Let me get this straight. What you're saying is Mason was illegal. Yes. Judge McEwen, District Attorney McEwen, right. came and ordered a special prosecutor from Philadelphia, right. Richard Sprague, right. to come in, seize all the records, right. and what he did was sat on them for two years, yes. and then just one minor, the, the, the long and short of it is one minor charge yes. came from the whole thing. Absolutely. So what gives? They didn't want the Crime Commission to get to those records, and they were able to, they were able to do it using, I guess, legal gymnastics. I don't know the law, what powers special prosecutors or special investigators have in a situation like that, but they were able to keep the Crime Commission from getting access to those records. Now, the question When becomes, you say they, be specific. Who? They meaning the, 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 the people in the Republican machine in Delaware County that are functioning at the behest of John McClure. Okay. Um, I don't know how any of them would have known ahead of time that the Crime Commission was planning to do this because Crime Commission proceedings at the time were closed. They weren't open to the public. It is the case that Rocco Urella, who was on the state police in some capacity and was released from his state job, 
because of charges of wiretapping crime commission proceedings was hired within a couple of days of his firing as the chief, chief of detectives or one of the chief detectives in Delaware County. Whether he let them know, I have no idea. I have no, no proof that he did or he didn't. All I have is a series of coincidences. Uh, but the bottom line is that nobody was ever charged or taken to court for macing. They're very good at what they do, or they were. I, I can't speak for the people in charge now. But because you don't know. Not, don't you're know. not, you're right. not contrasting. You just said you don't know either right. way. Right. So how did someone actually get a job, and how was the committee person relevant? Well, if I, I've just moved into Delaware County. I don't know anything about the politics. I'm politically interested, aware. Uh, the first thing that would happen is somebody would knock on my door, and it would be the local committee man or the local precinct leader, and he'd tell them, you know, welcome to the county. Uh, by the way, we're all Republicans out here. You do understand that, right? Uh, and right then and there, the message is very clear. If you need something done, if you need a street light put in, if you're having problems with anything, it's best if you're a Republican. From that point, if you want to get involved, you can volunteer. You're invited to volunteer to do work, particularly at election time. You're not going to get paid for it. But um, you put enough years in, enough elections in working, and you work your way up. You get nominated for a, a, a precinct leader or a ward leader in Chester, whatever it is. And eventually you might get nominated if you show some, some brain, some initiative, but more than anything else, some a, a willingness to work, to work long hours, particularly election season, and an absolute total loyalty to the machine, you might find yourself in five or ten years running for a row office in the courthouse or running for some other job for which you'll get paid. If you're a lawyer, you might be appointed solicitor because every one of these towns had solicitors, when, at least when McClure was in power. Um, and if you continue, continue right up the ladder till you eventually become one of the select on the board of super on the war board. John, you actually spent a chapter on Chester and how the GOP kept control of Chester, oh, yeah. a, you know, minority um, jurisdiction for yeah. years yes. on a place that typically would be democratic. How did he do that? because he gave people what they wanted in Chester. And that was part of his, part of his success, was in Chester, as, the, as the, um, the demographics of Chester changed, he continued to serve that community as best he could. How? Uh, things like access to the county nursing home. You know, that used to be, I don't know how it is now, it used to be when McClure was alive, you didn't get into that nursing home without uh, sponsorship from your local committee man. And if you were Republican, you could pretty much be assured that you, were, if you would get you know, into the nursing home. Before uh, the New Deal, before all the, the social welfare programs at the, at the federal level, everything was local. Everything that you needed, you had to get at the local level. If your kid got in trouble with the cops and you could call your committee man and he might get him out if it wasn't a lot of trouble. If you had a very promising child who needed more to get ahead than what they were offering in the public schools, he might get a scholarship somewhere. Whatever it was, you went to your committee man and you would get it. It was social welfare before a social welfare system in this country. McClure, through his, his minions, dispensed all that. But, on the other hand, you better, not only you, but everybody who's voting age in your family, better be registered Republican and better get out to vote, because they knew who voted. So we have a senior citizen center that, through your research, it was actually used as a patronage gift. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That was standard procedure. And it wasn't just McClure that did it. That was throughout the state. McClure just, he perfected this kind of system. Okay, he didn't invent this. Oh, no, no. This is something that probably exists in other places. Sure. He just does it better than the average location. Which is why he stayed in power for 60 years and why he survived 
a federal bootlegging uh, trial in which he was convicted initially, why he survived the trial in Chester, the, the swindle of half a million dollars from the city of Chester for the waterworks. Uh, he survived all kinds of scandals that would have destroyed lesser politicians. So this is what probably a member of the GOP out here in Delaware County would say, just look to Philadelphia. Democrats do the same thing. You wouldn't dispute Absolutely. that. Absolutely not. I wouldn't dispute that for a second. No. I think that's a fair point for us to make at this point. Sure. I, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, You'll see this in I Chicago. This is, You'll see this in Philadelphia. You'll see this in New York by the Democrats. Boston. You see it in Albany. You see it in, in Pittsburgh after David Lawrence comes to power in 1933. You're not here picking on the Republican Party. No, no, You're no, no, talking no. about machine politics. I'm talking right? about one, one party rule will eventually evolve into this kind of machine politics which at its heart is not democratic and it's, it, it's not moral, it's immoral, it's power for power's sake, which was always the question in my mind with McClure. And it's at its most effective, pretends to be democratic, creates the illusion of democracy, sure. but actually isn't. Yes, and that, if one could have seen, uh, you would have seen it on election day because as I said before, he was never sure. So while he could count on this army of patronage workers, there was the, the phantom voters, you know, the, uh, the people helping out with people who, who can't fill out their ballots. There's the rigging of, of voting machines. There's all kinds of games that they would play. In fact, Chester at one point, um, there was one ward, I think it was a, the ninth or 10th ward in Chester, that would always be the last ward in the entire county to uh, report its returns and they would call down and they would they would tell them how many votes they needed for this countywide election or that countywide election and the guy who ran that ward would just go in and rim up, ring up that many votes on the machine. So you talked about election day politics. Mm -hmm. Tell us about more of the election season and how he ran campaigns for himself or his party. Well number one he didn't run for any election after he lost his, a, a bid to, to keep his Senate seat in the mid-30s. He lost to a guy named Weldon, ha Welburn, Weldon Hayburn. Um, this was in the wake of the bootlegging conviction. So we're back in the 30s? Oh, or back in the 30s. And, and actually, he went into kind of semi-retirement after that, and there was fear that the whole Republican organization was going to fall apart. The biggest fear was in the mind of Joe Pugh. Joe Pugh was Sun Oil Company, of course, and, and he was a, a dedicated foe of FDR and the New Deal. And he's the one who actually uh, convinced McClure to come back out of self-imposed exile and come back and, and take over the machine again. But election day, people were very busy. They would uh, make sure that everybody could get to the polls. If you needed a ride, they'd come out and get you. Now they would use police to do this. They would use just the plain old party workers. They would go to the houses. Uh, oftentimes in Chester it would be a policeman that would show up at your door in uniform. Did you vote yet? Have you, have you cast your vote? How about your husband? Uh, how about your son, the, the, the one who's old enough to vote? Did he vote yet? So there was a certain this... amount of intimidation there. Sure, let's make this point. If you have the entire courthouse working for you, you would have county employees participating on your own election team. Exactly what the people in Harrisburg got in trouble for not too many years ago. Sure, sure. This was this was standard procedure. But he couldn't get in trouble because if the people enforcing these laws are on part of your payroll, right. you're not going to get caught. And not only that, he's not an elected official. He officially is just a member of this informal board of supervisors, one among equals. So he can't get in trouble for being an elected official no. and acting for a political party. Exactly. And that's why he stayed out of government. That's, well, after his conviction he did. Sure. And, and in fact, in the, the trial over the waterworks when they, when they swindled the city of Chester, the, the guy de Furia, the prosecuting attorney, tried to argue that he was indeed, as a political boss, he was, it was tantamount to holding political office. And the one judge bought the argument, but on appeal, 
it was it was rejected. He was not an elected official. He was not a public official at all. Private hey, citizen. Hey, Guy Furia sat for uh, as an interviewee on your. Oh role. yeah, is that he, right? Amazingly interesting guy. Sure. But you know what? And and he had he had no regard for John McClure's morals. Nonetheless, he at one point in his career was an attorney for the Republican organization, and he was a solicitor in several boroughs or municipalities in the county, and he had to get those appointments uh, through, indirectly through McClure. Let's make a point right here. You made a comment, no regard for McClure's morals, but really what we mean are ethics, okay. right? Because ethics. you actually make a point in this book that McClure of all the, oh my God. shall we say, benevolent, oh, so, oh, shall we say, yeah. dicta dictators, actually took less or did it with, shall we say, a conscience uh, compared to other people who ruled the way he did? He was not in it for the money. He, uh, 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 he never, to my mind, was in it for the money. I think that John McClure thought that he knew better how to run the county efficiently than anybody else and he was going to impose his will to make sure the county was run efficiently as possible. And as I say any, a couple times in the book, he provided what people wanted. In the early days, he provided whatever was needed from the, the immigrant populations that were coming into the county. During Prohibition, he provided what people wanted, the law forbade, but what the people wanted. Um, he kept blacks out of traditionally white areas of the county when that was an issue. Uh, he was a product of his time. Sure he was. Sense. Sure he was. It's inexcusable, but... It th there were just certain... It was understood. There were certain municipalities or certain parts of municipalities that were considered black. And the vast majority of the county was not black. Here's a point that I want to make. You specified this in your book, sure. that it was not, greed was not his issue. Not at all. It was efficiency. And efficiency for him was not democracy. Perhaps the best way to rule a county is to make it look like it's democratic so that people remain happy. But as I say in the book, I never thought that the majority of people in this county really gave a wit about democracy. The snow was plowed, the buses ran on time, the trash was picked up, the little leagues ran on time, the schools were okay, people had parks. Life was pretty good. And that's what people were concerned about before democracy. On all my interviews, and I interviewed far more opponents of John McClure than friends, only one man thought that he was such a horrible person that all that stuff shouldn't have counted, it should have been democratic rule. All the rest of them had to grudgingly say, yeah, the county was run pretty well. And you make that point in the book, Absolutely, didn't you? absolutely. Yeah, you commented on what you saw. Yeah. yeah. So you make a lot of strong points here in your book and today. Just go through a little bit of your sources because you did know a lot. Oh, you, you, gosh. Do, you made a lot. <laughs> Describe where your research took you. Well, I started local with the, the uh, Historical Society in Delaware County, and they have on microfilm, they have the Chester Times, and I spent months going through those, those newspapers just looking for anything. Uh, I went down to the Hagley Museum, where there's certain collections of papers, mostly the, the, the Pew Sun Oil papers. I went to University of Maryland, which had the papers of the union that was involved with the unionization of the Sun Shipyard, and that was a big issue between McClure and Joe Pugh. Uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I went to the Historical Society of, of Pennsylvania in town. <coughs> Excuse me, I went up to Harvard. Now, I can't remember the name of the library at Harvard. Uh, looking, I was I was a thousand places. You know, Nixon changed the route of his campaign through uh, Delaware County in 1960, and he made sure he got out of his car and went up onto the porch of the house of 20th and Providence to shake McClure's hand. Uh, you have a picture of that in your book. Yeah, yeah. He, Nixon was no dummy. He knew where the, you know, all politics is local. Uh, but he just, he, he was reserved and he was aloof and he didn't tolerate 
personal immorality. Uh, Stanley Branch particularly couldn't stand Stanley Branch, mainly because of the way Stanley Branch treated the woman who was the, the, the chair of the school board in Chester during all that ruckus in the 1960s. He was just appalled at the way this man would treat a woman. And he wasn't by any means, he wasn't any kind of sexist. He had women, uh, he always had a woman as the co-chair of the executive committee of the Republican Party, the official committee for the for the party for the county he was a man of his times uh, and in his in his personal life a very straight-laced moralistic man but he like a lot of people like John D Rockefeller could teach Sunday school on Sunday and go into the business world and be an, an absolute pirate on Monday and with John McClure he could be the most straight-laced strict moralistic man in his personal life and yet treat people with, with absolute cutthroat. Um, when he needed to. <laughs> yeah, when he wanted to, and, and just fire people, get rid of people, um, and not really give much of a care about what they felt like or how it embarrassed them. So have you seen John McClure's signature past his life on the Delaware the other uh, Delco Republican machine. To an extent, I have. Uh, when he, as he, when he passed, actually, the the war board became what he always claimed it had been, you know, a much more democratic organization. But with that democratization of the machine, came a little bit of, of falling apart as people started bickering with each other. Um, I don't know. Now I I don't keep track closely of Delaware County politics because I've been out in Lancaster County for 20 years. But certainly I heard about this, this election, the, the most recent election. Well, even before we get there, yeah. let me ask you this. How do you think the Delaware County Republicans stayed in power even after losing a majority here of, of registration voters? Well, I think that the, the, the legacy of McClure uh, and what people who came after him uh, understood about how he ran the county uh, lasted for a long time. I think voters, to a certain extent, you know, they're Republican, they're going to stay Republican unless there's a real good reason for them to change their registration. Um, and there hasn't been for many years a real good reason for them to change their registration. There was somewhat of a revolt in 74 with uh, Bob Edgar being elected and there's, there were, the Democrats won, won some, some local races. But that was probably more, th more than anything, it was Richard Nixon. Reaction to Watergate. Exactly, just like the reaction to Trump today. Um, there were some local things that were happening. There was a battle going on between Williams and uh, the guy who, Sam Dickey in Upper Darby. And there was also, the scandal was just breaking of the greater Chester movement and all the waste and whatnot. McClure would not have allowed that if had he lived. He would have controlled that money that was going into, into Chester and made sure that the kind of things that, that came about after his death would not have happened. And when was this? When was the this Chester was, scandal? This was the early 70s. Okay. Um, All happened at the same time. So you had a yeah. local scandal and you had a federal scandal right. that created so a perfect this, storm. This coalescence. And you got a guy like Edgar who's a, a good looking young guy. He wasn't Catholic, but a Kennedy esque kind of person. And so he got elected. He was the 70s version of what we had Joe Sestak yeah. in 2000s. Exactly. In fact, he beat Steve McEwen. And that was part of the, the issue, too, because it was a fight between Larry Williams and Sam Dickey as far as who they were going to support to run on the Republican ticket for the 7th Congressional District. But Edgar won, uh, and he won successive elections, but each one, as I recall, by a smaller and smaller margin. And the, the success at the local level did not last. And by, I think Edgar eventually, if memory serves, decided he could win the state a Senate seat which was just silly, just like Sestax made a mistake running for the Senate. Sure. And he lost that election, he was out of Congress, he was gone, and things resumed. Uh, the hostility between the, the Republicans who were running the various municipalities in the county settled down, 
and there was kind of this peaceful coexistence. There was never anybody who emerged as the new John McClure, at least not to my knowledge. If there was, that person stayed way, way in the background. Um, but that person would be the chair of the bar party, at least in title, correct? Right. Even, even without a boss like McClure, they learned their lessons well, and they apparently they've lasted because the, the, the Republican Republican rule has lasted. Uh, it, it lasted through the Edgar Edgar years, and he was gone, and virtual Republican dominance continued, except perhaps in media. Um, and now, with this most recent election, and the registration, changes in registration, the changes in demographics in the county, perhaps um, things are starting to change, but I caution people about that. I actually wanted to ask you about that specifically. Sure. We had a conversation yeah. right after the presidential election, not, I'm sorry, right after the county election, right. where the Democratic row offices uh, all went Democratic, right. and we had a discussion, and you said, I'm not ready to pronounce the GOP no, dead ready, just yet. Not ready to pop the corks on the champagne yet, right? because at least three times during, during the, the heyday of the machine in 1919, when William Cameron Sproul, who became governor, thought he had crushed the machine, and then again in the mid-late 30s, when McClure was suffering the, the, the fallout from his, his federal conviction, and he lost his Senate seat. And the renegade Republicans at the time managed to win a number of elections. And then again, during the Edgar time, this is three times that it seemed like that was it for the machine. Twice when McClure was running the show, the third time after McClure was gone. But it didn't happen. And my contention is that until the Democrats can get at least one seat on the county bench, that they're really not going to be in a position to think that they've broken the back of the Republican organization in the county. At the time of filming, we're March 23rd, 2018, and the Republicans have just endorsed a candidate, uh, Pearl Kim. There is another candidate that jumped in late. But anyway, the Republicans, there were six, and the Republicans endorsed a candidate. And right now, it's before a nominating convention for the Democratic Party, and there's 14 uh, congressional uh, candidates for this 5th district, mm -hmm. and that's the district that would represent Delaware County. Right. Now, uh, again, compare and contrast the approaches of the two different uh, political parties, how the GOP handles their party and how Democrats typically handle their party. I would say it's democracy versus discipline. Um, the Republicans appear to be very disciplined. They're going to put their efforts behind one person. The Democratic Party is going to, they've, they've opened it up. They want people to run or, or they, they encourage people to run because they believe in democracy. But what that does is it dilutes the vote. And what you might have, and I don't know how it's going to how it's going to play out, but you might have a very destructive fight for that nomination. I can re, I can compare that directly to 1938, when Governor Earl, who was the first Democratic governor in Pennsylvania since the 19th century, had just finished the last two of his four years as governor, very successful, brought the Little New Deal to Pennsylvania. And the Democrats decided, this is great. Now we just continue with this plan. But they didn't get together and endorse one person. They had a number of people that were vying for the Democratic nomination. And what they did, it turned into a bloody warfare. And the Republicans, uh, a guy named Arthur James, won the election because the Democrats just split the vote. There's a time for democracy. but. There's a time, you, you have to be practical in politics. And unfortunately, politics is not always that democratic. You can you know, stand on your high horse and say, well, above all else, we want democracy. McClure didn't care about democracy. He cared about delivering what people wanted. And that's why he stayed in power. And if the Democratic Party wants 
to be successful, they'll very quickly get behind one person, they'll do what they need to do to satisfy the people who they don't endorse. With what kind of promises? I don't know. But they need to exercise the same amount of discipline as far as their choice of candidates as the Republicans do, and perhaps then they'll have a shot at it. Well, but isn't this, aren't you proposing a different form of government almost, at least at the primary stage? Isn't I don't think I'm proposing a different form of government because it hasn't been democratic in this county since 1875, probably since the Civil War. No, it's, it's politics is the art of the possible, and it's wonderful. If you, can have, if, the, if you can have people running and you have these kind of altruistic motive, motives and people are just, they, 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 they're focused on these, the high, the great issues of the day. Politics is a down and dirty, day-to-day -day blood sport. And people should understand that. McClure was so good at what he did because he understood it's blood sport. And the Democrats, if they want long term to be successful, uh, although I wouldn't wish too much success on them because the success the Democrats had in Philadelphia in the 1950s evolved into the Democratic machine that runs that city now. Uh, I think it's human nature that one party being, being in power too long and it loses its, loses its reformist, you know, altruistic motivations. But nonetheless, uh, you can't be too idealistic. You have to be practical, you have to be pragmatic at some point. And as I say, they would do well to get behind one candidate. And of course they still have uh, the president to run against, which is a help. Um, and perhaps they'll win. They've won before. So what danger do you see to a group of stubborn, perseverant candidates who say, I'm a great candidate, I didn't have the endorsement, but I'm going to the end because I know that I am good for my district. What do you say to a county that's got a group of maybe five to seven that won't get out of the race because they think that darn it, they'll be a good congressperson? I say you're going to guarantee the, the election of your opponent. Ross Perot is a perfect example. You know, any kind of, any time a third party, a third candidate, or more get into the race, they're going to get some votes. Where would those votes go if that candidate or those candidates weren't in the race? They're probably going to go to whoever's left from that party. It's, it's, it's self-destructive to do that. And why? Why not just let it play out? Won't the best person win? No. Why? The person with the best organization is going to win. Why? Because that's the way the way politics works. It's it's discipline, and if the Republicans are running one candidate against four or five Democratic candidates, uh, unless that one candidate is so powerfully popular that just overwhelms everybody else, the vote will be split, and the Republican won't win a majority, but he'll win a plurality, and well, that's all he wants. But won't it be settled at the primary, and then they all drop out, and then you have a second bite? It depends on how the primary is conducted. And if it gets bitter, and I don't know that I don't know these candidates, but if it gets bitter, that could last into the, the general election. And then you have division when it comes sure, to the general. Sure, sure, yeah. It's it's hum you know they, this this term political science is the silliest term in the world. There's nothing scientific about the way people behave, and particularly how they behave in politics. Uh, you can do all the the polling you want, and my good friend does a lot of polling. But people run on emotion, and people run on their wants and desires, um, and they're going to vote for the person they think they want to have in office because that person's going to do the best for them, not for society generally, or their borough, or their township. Uh, it's, that's just the way it is. Did we see some of this in the presidential election of 2016 in the Democratic Party? <sighs> yeah, we did. We did. We saw it in, well, we didn't see it in 2000. I started to say we saw it in 2008. I thought the 2008 primary was going to, to, to kill the Democratic Party because, if you recall, it got very bitter between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. They managed to mend fences. 
uh, in 2016, uh, we saw some of it. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Particularly in the Republican, well, in the, in the Democratic Party, there was some questionable uh, tactics that were employed to, to kind of diminish the threat of Bernie Sanders because he wasn't the organization's choice in that election. Right. Uh, but afterwards, you had everyone unify around Trump, and it yeah. looks like some Bernie Sanders supporters did not uh, unify around Hillary. They were very bitter. Sure. Very, very bitter. And um, the results are history. Yeah. So again, to summarize, your words are one of a warning to the 5th Congressional District, yeah. the Democrats of that district. Yeah. It'd be, ethics are great. Ideals are great. Being idealistic is great. You can be idealistic after you get in office, but you've got to get there first. <laughs> All right. John, let's leave it there. And I want to okay. thank you for being a guest on Delaware County Political sure. News. Nice to be here. <laughs> We have been here with Professor John McLarnon, and I am your host, Larry DeMarco. If you like this video, please share it with all your contacts, and please subscribe to the channel. We are signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now.